My name is Jeff Patterson. Today I'm going to be talking a little bit about code and beauty. So they say beauty is in the eye of the beholder, and I believe that that's true. I think that we all see things beautiful through our own perspective, through who we are, through the families that we have, and the friends we associate with, the education that we receive, and the passions that we have. Everybody in this room is from a similar enough background that we likely all, when we see this Monet, find it beautiful. The same thing is true with this Renoir. But beauty has a perspective. Different people see things beautiful. When we were in high school, we were all through education, given the opportunity to experience the beauty of Shakespeare. For some of us, this left a deep, profound mark, and we became lifelong Shakespeare lovers. For others of us, this was an enrichment opportunity that maybe was soon forgotten. Same thing for classical music. There are those of us in this room that enjoy going to the symphony. And there are others that when a classical song comes on the radio, we turn the dial. Things that are functional can be beautiful as well. We likely can all see the beauty in these buildings. But a trained architect can see beauty in a building that to me is just a structure. The architect can appreciate things about that that I can't appreciate and see beauty where I can't see it. So when I flash this image up on the screen, everybody in this room has some kind of reaction. Everybody feels something or thinks something. For some people, it might be an emotional response. It might be confusion or maybe even fear. For other people, perhaps a mental image flashes into your head, maybe one of these guys, or uh, maybe one of the devices that their companies build that's in your pocket or on your desk. Or maybe something like this, an image of somebody that maybe spends too much time on the computer. When I see this image, I can recognize this as a piece of code written in C programming language. It's written to solve the mathematical factorial problem, and it's done using a recursive algorithm. But aside from all those mechanical things, I can see that this is elegantly written. I can see that this is beautiful code. When I see this, I get an emotional response. Because for me, code can be like poetry. So I want to tell you the story about a fourth grade boy in 1984 growing up in Dillingham, Alaska, a small fishing village. And this boy was sitting in class one day and the teacher said, class, get up, we're going to another classroom. So he got up and got in line and followed the class down to a part of the school he wasn't familiar with. And as they were reaching their classroom destination, he could see in the classroom and there were tables set up and chairs and in front of each chair was a device, a piece of technology. He couldn't see it very well, but he was starting to get kind of excited. And as he got closer, his excitement built, and when he got into the room, he started to get very excited because sitting in front of every chair was this piece of high-tech future, something like off of the Starship Enterprise that Han Solo might use in the Millennium Falcon. He couldn't believe that he was going to get an opportunity to interact with this piece of technology. <laughs> and his teacher said, this is a computer. And you don't know how to use it, and I don't know how to use it. We're going to work together. And over a couple of days, that's just what happened. He became familiar with this. And one day when he got into this classroom, his teacher had loaded a, a program up. It looked something like this. It was much more archaic than this, but it looked something like this. And the teacher explained, today, you're going to learn some commands to move that triangle. That boy's engaged. He's sitting there. He's ready to go. He's chomping at the bit. The teacher ruffles around and gets a typewritten piece of paper out and reads on the top. OK, the first command we're going to issue is FD space 100. Everybody type that in, FD space 100. Boy types it in and hits return, and boom, the triangle jumps forward on the screen. FD 100, forward 100. Boy's getting pretty excited. Now, what's the next command? What's the next command? The teacher looks down on the paper. LT space 90, L LT space 90. Type that in, LT space 90, return. LT space left turn, 90 degrees. Boy tunes the teacher out at this point. He is off to the races. FD100, LT90, FD100, LT90, FD100, LT90, square. He is excited. He's coming out of his skin with what's going on here. He looks around the classroom, sharing the excitement with the other uh, classmates, and realizes that they may have two lines on their screen. And a couple of them look like they're ready for gym or recess. <laughs> what did this boy really learn during this session? He learned, I can make this happen. He also learned, this is a, this nature of this square is no longer just some geometric abstract figure. This is a real living thing. 
he rode the sides of that. He turned those 90 degree corners as he drew that on the screen in his mind. And maybe more elusive, but no less important, he began to understand relativistic thinking. Left turn 90 degrees relative to what? If I turn left 90 degrees, I'm going out that door. If you turn left 90 degrees, you're going out that door. Which of us is right? This boy now understands that they're both right. It's all about perspective. That boy that day was profoundly moved because of that lesson. And a lot of the kids in there weren't profoundly moved, but every kid that came out of that classroom had a deeper appreciation and an understanding of that machine that they had sat down in front of. Our school system does an amazing job of preparing students for the future. Our teachers are hard at work every day on core instruction in math, science, reading, history, social studies. But we also give our students enrichment opportunities, classes that are designed to deepen their appreciation of the world, and maybe ignite some passion, things like art and music and industrial technologies. And they do this because we as a society find these things valuable. But I think it might be time for us as a society to evolve what we value. I'm going to tell you a few statistics. I'm not going to bore you with a bunch, but it's projected that by 2020, which is about six years away, sounds like it's a long ways away, six years away, it's projected that there will be about one million computer science-related jobs in this country unfilled because we don't have people going into this profession. And these are good jobs. These are high-paying jobs. Today, a four-year college graduate in computer science is amongst the most sought after employee. They can demand an average starting salary of $78,000. For your degree, no experience, average starting salary of $78,000. And they can live wherever they want in the world. These are startling statistics. But perhaps the most startling is, given that this is the world that we live in and the world that we're entering, that only one in 10 of our schools formally introduce students to code. Nine in 10 are missing out on this great opportunity. Now, how is it that the world that we live in has this future and this present, but nine of 10 schools is not taking an opportunity to expose students to code? I think it's for two different reasons. I think the first reason is, is that teachers are busy. They're very busy. Their days are completely filled doing the things that we value, teaching math and science and reading and art and industrial technologies. But I think that we as a society need to learn to place new kinds of expectations on our teachers. And given that values change over time, because technology changes over time. So teachers are very busy. That's the first challenge that we face. The second is, is that teachers teach what teachers know. Few teachers went to school and were given the tools, the resources, the education to bring computer science related disciplines into their classroom and give their kids an opportunity. The good news is, is that that barrier is being torn down. There are a lot of freely available resources out there now, including curriculum, that teachers can take and adopt and bring into their classrooms and give their students an opportunity. So I've listed some here on the screen. I'm actually going to demonstrate two of them for you today and uh, show you a little bit about how those look. The first one I'm going to show you is uh, called Scratch. It's a learning language developed at MIT for eight-year-olds or greater. That's third grade. Uh, so you don't have to be uh, a high school student to start learning some of these fundamentals. This is the programming language. It's visual, actually. You don't type anything in. It's almost like a child's toy building blocks. Right here is where we're going to write our program. These are the commands that we can use to write the program. We're going to make that kitty cat do something. That's what this programming language does. So the first thing we'll do is have the kitty cat move 10 steps. And you can see I just simply drag the command over. I don't have to write anything. I don't have to understand anything. I just have to know what command I want that kitty cat to follow. And uh, we want, if we reach the edge of the wall here, we want to bounce off of it. That's conditional. So there's a command for that, too. If I reach the edge, bounce off. And you can see it snaps into place again like a child's toy. And if I double click it, we do actually move our kitty cat across there. But I want it to be a little bit more user friendly for 
our users. So I'm going to have what's called an event, and this is a computer science discipline vocabulary word. Third grader doesn't need to know that, but uh, they're already being introduced to those concepts. And I'm going to say, when the space key is pressed, then run my code. So you'll see it does work, and if I hold down the space, I do, in fact, bounce off the edge when I get there. So this is fun. This is fun for a, a student to do, and it's not hard. But everybody in this room now, through this very simple demonstration, understands the concept of event-driven programming. When I push this space, the code runs. And we have the idea of uh, more than one command putting together to do something useful. And the concept of conditional uh, execution. If I get to the edge, then bounce off. Very simple things, but these are the core foundations for code in any programming language. Second thing I'm going to show is uh, from W3 Schools. This is uh, JavaScript on the left and a little power where it can run on the right hand side. JavaScript is a professional programming language. You actually use it every day of your life when you're on the internet. It's what gives the internet its dynamic feel. And the lessons that we just learned in Scratch perfectly translate to this piece of code right here. So we do a little uh, formatting here at the top, click the button, calculate X, and it's over here. And then we paint the button, and buttons have events. I can click them the same way that the keyboard has an event that I can press the key. And when I click it, it's going to run the code inside of my function. And that function is right here. The function sets up three variables, and those variables are exactly like when you were in pre-algebra. We've got y equals 5, z equals 2, and x equals y plus z, 5 plus 2. Everybody go ahead and do that math in your head, but don't shout out the answer. <laughs> so when we click this button, x is going to get the, uh, the sum of those two numbers, and it's going to be painted on the screen. Let's try it. So 5 plus 2 equals 7. If that's not the answer you got, then see me after the top. <laughs> so, and sort of prove that this actually does work, we'll change this to an 8. And now it'll be 8 plus 2 is 10. So this concept of event-driven programming is realized here in something a little bit more useful. And once we have these foundations in place, it's pretty straightforward to start building on top of that into something a little bit more useful. And the nice thing about Scratch work, learning any programming language, is that all programming languages are very similar. Uh, it's just usually syntax, which is the vocabulary of that programming language that, that substantially changes one to another. And so it makes it fairly straightforward to build something a little bit more useful if we type in. It's easier to do if the computer screen is directly in front of you. <laughs> and build something that is a little bit more real world applicable. I have a bug. I have two bugs. And that's the real world applicability right there. So a simple adding machine. And of course, you could expand upon that. But it's straightforward to build on these foundational principles and add little by little. This is not a discipline that you master overnight. It's a discipline that you take in steps. So the, the world's leaders of tomorrow are sitting in classrooms today all across our nation. And we're doing a good job of arming them with knowledge and broadening their horizons. But we're missing a, a huge opportunity right now. What could the world look like in 10 years if instead of 10% of our classes, 90% of our classes expose students to code? Not every student grows up to be a musician or a woodworker or a mathematician. And not every student's going to grow up to be a computer scientist even after we teach code in every school. But some will. Some will find their passion. Some will find their passion. And all of them will better understand the world that we live in today. So I think it's time for us as a society to evolve what we find valuable. We must embrace the fact that code is part of today's reality. So talk to your kids, teachers. Talk to your friends that are teachers. And ask them about this missed opportunity. And ask them what we could do about it. And ask them what we should do about it. 
There was one school's willingness to try something new way back in 1984 to put that boy in Alaska on the road that led him here before you today. Thank you.